Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. We're back. Hello. Um, I hope you guys are ready to perform later on tonight. I'm excited to hear some poems. Uh -huh. Woo! Mike, yeah. Is it? Um, yeah. Hello. Hello. There you go. So we're just gonna reteach slam rules real quick. Real quick, yeah. Yeah. So if you hear something that you really like or that resonates with you, you know, you just feel it in your body. Yeah. Let us know. And those are really helpful. Like it encourages us to be able to point too. So yeah. I'm sure you guys did the other one, but let's let's go over them real quick. Pop quiz though. Let's see if y'all remember the chants that we taught y'all earlier. Right? <laughs> one, two, three. You put your heart into it. I know you did. I know. And I know everyone. Right, right? right. Yeah. Two, three. Don't be Becky, Beyonce. Yeah. Right. Okay. You're ready. Yeah. So um, our first poem for tonight is called Wake Up America. And if you remember, welcome. welcome. <laughs> we changed it up. Uh, welcome. Um, and it talks about the Syrian refugee crisis. And it's been a while since we performed, so we're a little rusty. <laughs> you got this. Welcome, 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 welcome. Child, your mother is calling you, come mix into this melting pot. We invite the flavor, the culture, the warmth. Come to the land of the free, to the home of the brave. Whose land is this? How far does your freedom go back? Do you know the names of the tribes you stand on? Who decides who stands here? My torch is lit for you. I stand alone in the dark. Come join me, come. My soil is ready for your footprints. I have made this place one for your feet to stop all over the restrictions. Child, come swim in this liquor of liberty. Let me tell you, I fought hard for my freedom. My children are dead. My mother is dead. My father is dead. My family is dead. I'm alone. I cannot breathe. Tell me, who is truly welcome here? Lady Liberty, teach us again. I'm still teaching with open arms. Please join me. Please hug me. Enrich me. Truly make me great again. Lady Liberty, you were built to break the chains at your feet. You were a gift that tried to erase the memory of a time that my dark revokes. I am with heads down, souls broken. Can your people welcome us without owning us? Yes, I am a mother. You are my children. I cannot own my own kin. My family is deeper than countries and boundaries. My bloodline is thicker than oceans. Give me all those who ache to breathe in a space where they'll not be beaten for daring to let their lungs expand. Yes, I want your tired, poor, the ones yearning to breathe free. Child, breathe free. We can't breathe. The walls can talk of building are closing in on us. Where is the freedom she wants to give us so graciously? Why do you refuse to pay when you accepted us yesterday? You are welcome. I invite you who have suffered to enjoy this freedom, to be fed. I'll let you in, have let them in. I held my torch for all to see when they drew close, that their travel had paid off. I'm so prepared for the waves, the currents of people washing onto my beaches. Do you mean the pollution? We are trash. We, we take, take up too much space. No one speaks up for us. We're the neighbors who stole your jobs, who built your jobs. Oh, how you forget history. You turned away Jewish refugees and sent them back to Europe, sent them back to the camps they had run from. They were so close, waiting on the beaches of Florida, full of hope. America would save them, you would save them, but we're a threat, aren't we? That justifies it, right? We're spies, a danger to national security. We were, we are, scary, dangerous, foreign. But aren't we all your children? It is time to make amends. Knock, knock. We're here. Thank you. Okay, so this piece is called You're White, and it's basically about redefining what black means to us. Hey, black girl. It's almost like you're white. What, what does, does that even mean? mean? That my voice is a little too high for my identity? That I carry buttons around instead of a bottle of Hennessy? That my tongue articulates without an accent? That I can't use slang because you got me back. Tell me, is white a remedy to the poison of blackness? 
Is my coffee color too black or too strong? Or do you call me white because I spent $4.99 on a Penelope Frappuccino? Actually, girl, you should try the ice caramel macchiato. <laughs> does white to you mean educated, successful, satisfaction guaranteed, or does it mean participating in extracurriculars? You know, doing the most, getting away with stuff, being from a good family. I, I have a good family, family, and I'm not white. I don't want this to be called white. Certainly not the type of white that comes with white guilt. The white of the past. The white of colonialism, occupation, oppression. The white of right now. The white privilege. I'm, I'm not, not privileged. privileged. Don't, don't call me white. Or do you call me white? Black is broken. Let me tell you, in this box of crayons, black is the color most used, broken, and left behind. But I'm not a crayon that can be left behind. Let's rewind. It's our people who work the jobs you think you've seen. So don't tell me we're no longer needed, because I said up for AP classes, honors classes. I'm pursuing my high school education, college education, even, even though, though no one in my family has a college level education. Hey, black girl, it's almost like you're black. <laughs> Does this blood not remind you of the aftermath of a genocide? 
We serve men as if this is worship, as if a temple allows for the cracked bones of a servant. Haven't you heard? A slave is only one if they're useful, strong enough, helps a master uphold his status. To you, I hold nothing but the rank of my father, that my labor molds his happiness. Is this what it means to be a real woman? As if nothing else matters? As if 2018 kitchens still come with a warning sign, never let your son or husband enter. A line repeated over and over and over again that has become a promise, an expectation, a ticket to womanhood. This is what it looks like to be a woman, to be rewired back to the same routine, but still tick, tick. So the next poem is a solo that I wrote, um, and it's called American Egyptian. Um, can you all hear me back there? Yeah. 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 Sure. And so this sort of covers sort of a convoluted issue that I faced with my identity in middle school, where um, obviously I went to a prim uh, predominantly white middle school and I faced a lot of issues with my culture and tend to whitewash myself, um, and then going home and then facing my Egyptian culture and sort of being embarrassed of it when I go to school, so. And then also being visibly Muslim as well. Growing up in my Egyptian household, my father and I would eat mangoes and dance to Um Kulthum's voice, which was sweeter than the fruit we munched on. My uncle would tell my brother and I old Egyptian stories that would make our hearts beat fast and echo in our ears like drums. My grandmother would call me every night and remind me at the end of our conversations, Dawam al hal al muhal. Translation, nothing stays the same. She was right. I quickly realized my peers could not understand the tongue my parents gave me as a gift, so I washed it away with the English alphabet, quickly forgetting the only language my family knew. I was embarrassed whenever, whenever my mother, whenever my friends mocked my mother's broken down English, destroying my dignity whenever she spoke so I would make fun of her too. I used to hate my Egyptian skin. It would scream while the white flesh surrounding me were silent. I was different. I carried two cultures like it was a burden so I tried letting go of one but I couldn't. Instead others tried to get rid of one for me by telling me I'm not American. My skin too dark for their American flag so I laughed. My red lips carving around my white teeth, causing blue tears to run down my cheeks. It's funny because they don't realize that this American flag is mine. This birth certificate is mine. I sit in the battle of Egyptians mocking my broken down, watered down, beaten down Arabic while my fellow Americans swing at the epitome of my bloodline while whispering in my ear that I do not belong. I blamed my parents. Blamed them for bringing me into a country that already hated me before I could, before I could even hate myself. I was a girl who carried no country. I let others name me in their own language until I forgot every word of my own and I chose to follow them. Now, when the doctors drop my blood, I feel the pain of my parents leaving the country they love. They came to America to give me a blue passport for freedom, but people laugh when I say I'm from here, making me feel like a dead girl that's been poured back into her body. People come to me and ask me which I hold first, American or Egyptian. I did not know I had to choose one over the other because to you I can never be both, but I am. And I dance on the soil of my country without tripping over my skin, dancing to the sound of others mocking me, but I do not listen, laughing at the humor of ignorant Americans naming me as I will, but I do not forget. I do not forget that a plant needs its roots to grow stronger. I remember my family's blood and the open sky. I remember that I do not lie but face the aesthetic truth, that I can run my hands on my strong skin without the consent of others, remembering that this is me, that I can carry the history of two cultures without getting tired, that I love my parents for bringing me into a country full of hate so I can create hope. And now, my grandmother's words replay in my head. Dawam al hal al muhal. Nothing stays the same. She was right because I am no longer a girl who hates her Egyptian skin. I am a girl who will throw hands at a single soul that will speak poorly on my mother's broken down English. I am a girl who loves her Egyptian skin unconditionally, who can lift the weight of two cultures without getting tired, who can be American in an Egyptian body. So this piece is called Balance Beam, and I mean, it'll explain itself. 
Um, gym class, 2009. A young girl steps in to face her biggest fear yet. She thinks to herself, nothing can hold her back from this kind of success, can tell her she can't do it, can scare her away, nothing but the balance beam. She hops onto it hoping it would be just as easy for her to make it across the damn thing as it was for the other kids. She wishes for one single chance to prove to the rest that she could maintain balance. She crosses her fingers that no one would laugh. Little does she know that with one foot comes the stumbling of another, that we are not all as nimble as Jack, that this beam was not made for victory on her part. There never seems to be victory on her part, only obstacles. But she dodges these obstacles, no bullets, it's matrix. Puts on costumes to make everyone comfortable, it's white chicks. Doesn't know how to choose one thing over the other, twilight, eclipse, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to compare my life to a movie, but nowadays I can't separate fantasy from reality. And all my energy is focused on what I can't have because what I do have is something most can't handle. I can't handle. I'm black. I'm proud to be black. Scared to be black. I'm black. They tell me I'm beautiful in my skin, but how far does beauty roll off your tongue? They tell me that diversity is what completes their community. Accepting is different from tolerating. They tell me I will never again be considered below them, but our bodies have sunk before. You engulf us whole, still assuming we'll make it in time for a breath of air. And it takes no time for you to swivel your head around and look at me whenever slavery is mentioned. Is black blood the only blood in the room? Look at me. I'm not only black, I'm Muslim. I brush those terrorist jokes off my back, but all the body is connected in front of the back is the heart, though you may not see it. My heart just died a little. And yes, these are the words that you, these are the jokes that you and your friends whisper as if I'm blind, deaf, mute. Honey, I would respond if I could, but I've been taught that silence is sometimes better. But I can't stay silent when Islam is our new unit in school. <clears throat> Did you need help pronouncing the words Quran, Hajj, and Allah? By the way, it's Quran, Hajj, and Allah. My point is, when I'm not running away from the sirens warning me, get away, you don't belong because you're black, I'm running away from the voices telling me you clearly don't belong, you're Muslim. I'm convinced that there are two TV screens in my house and when one is off, the other automatically goes on. You see, white folks never hesitate to tell black Muslim people who they are and what they do. Sometimes I shift my weight to one side of the scale because I appreciate one part of me over the other. Will I ever appreciate both simultaneously? It's hard enough being one color, one person, one identity, imagine being two. And no, this is not a cry for help because you had your chance, but you didn't. This isn't some child screaming for attention because you didn't dare look. This is not just a poem informing you of what you do because you already know. This is me telling you that my life isn't Hannah Montana. It's not the best of both worlds. This is me telling you that my voice seems to be the only thing that matters. And I'm gonna use my voice to tell you I'm both black, Muslim, in a world where it's hard, no, exhausting to find balance on a balanced beam. Thank you. All right, so our last poem, and then we'll do some Q&A, and then the open mic, um, is Wake Up America. There's like an order of every poem. <laughs> Ambassador for all 1.6 billion Muslims. 
March 21st, 2003. Fireworks were thrown into a Palestinian's family van. Flames burned brighter than the rocket's red glare. America, what, what are you celebrating? April 6, 2004, homeless Hijab ripped off and she was verbally assaulted. But she's dangerous. Right? She deserves this. Right? Whoa, wait, wait. But it's her body. Right. right. Women should be able to do what they want. Right. So, so if you can show, why can't we conceal? August 6, 2007, a chemical bomb was thrown at a mosque in Glendale, Arizona. The bomb almost had two Muslim Americans. Imagine what could have happened. Two mothers could have lost their sons. Two men could have lost their lives. But wait. America, America, you don't care about our protection because, because you're trying to protect yourself from us. From me. I was on my way home from school. You decided to cross the other side of the street. Was the service I walked too hot for you to come near? Did you know that your looks flamed the fire of insecurities within me? August 24, 2010, a taxi driver picks up Michael Enright, his first passenger of the day. He thinks it'll be an average ride until he uttered the word Muslim. Muslim. Michael Enright slashed the taxi driver's face. Not once, not, not twice. twice. What a price to pay for the freedom of your rights. What happened to our freedom of religion? What promise to you, and you, and you, and, and me? me? What about me? It's the first day of school. I'm the only Muslim girl wearing the hijab. I can feel everyone's eyes razor sharp, their lips forming questions. Who knew curiosity could cut so deep? I just wanted to curl up in a corner. February, February 10, 2010. Imagine you're a Muslim. Going to your house of prayer and seeing the words, Muslim, go home, dripping in red paint on the white walls. Go home, they said. Go home where? The hospital I was born. The city that I was raised. We're not just Muslims. We're, We're American, American Muslims, Muslims, equal in every way. I heard the words roll off his tongue. You Muslims are the reason why the airport lines are so long, you bombers. He was drunk, but a drunk mind speaks a sober heart. These are the things we see, hear, and experience daily. And now you know of these. Hidden, Hidden crimes, unheard voices, terror on all Muslims, restless souls, guns, and bullet holes. Wake up, America. The enemy has always been here. Thank you. Like, I think we just had like a, this intimacy that other people didn't have, and 
I think that's become really special for us, especially growing up in a state like Vermont, where that is especially rare, um, that the bond really just seemed unbreakable, you know? Yeah, and like in the beginning, like you mentioned, like we weren't really close, like we just kind of wrote together, but that was about it. But we all started getting vulnerable and like really sharing our experiences and like truly, truly being like completely honest with one another. And like there was times when we would cry together while writing, you know? So uh, like multiple <laughs> times. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. But like things like that, moments like that bring you so close and like at the end of the day, like during that time, you know they're there to support you, you know? And even though we're like completely go to two completely different schools, we're always there to support each other, whether that's a phone call or FaceTime. Mm -hmm. you know? so, yeah. And I think also like we, we were able to learn so much with each other, like mm -hmm. with like all the travels that we've been through, especially with like Brave New Voices and learning together has really cultivated conversations and brought in different experiences and viewpoints that we hadn't noticed. So I think that really has solidified our group and, and what the platform that we are trying to create for other Muslim youth or other youth. Yeah. Especially now, like that. Now that we have like this like distance between us, like at least like if we don't have anything else to talk about, we have like memories now. Mm -hmm. And I think also like the joyousness that we talked about earlier, like is really rooted in there because it's not like we only hit each other up when like things are going bad. Like the fact that we get like like Balkis, for example, Balkisa earlier this year went to California. All his friends paid trip, met Yara Shahidi, did big things, big <laughs> big things, you know, paid trip to California. And when she does that, I'm like. Keith, let me talk to you for an hour about that because that's so cool, you know? So I think like the fact that we're able to support each other at the highs and lows and really just be like so happy for each other when anything happens or like really be there for each other. Yeah, I feel like it's one thing when we accomplish something as a group that we all get to share, but I think I'm so much more happier or like better feeling knowing that like they did something on their own, you know? Yeah. It's like, wow, like you did that on your own. So yeah. And like we can see our growth too. We're like, yeah, I do want from like five people in a box of pizza. Yeah. <laughs> so like, you know? Yeah. And I think like, adding on to what Kisa just said, we are so used to each other, and we're so used to like act, uh, doing or uh, participating in activism together. Like that, we've just like whenever one of us like leaves what by our, like by our side, we're just really upset. We just like want each other together, and like that's when like MGMC ended. We were like, what do we do now? Like, who are we without oh, MGMC? Oh God, so yeah, that was really yikes. like <laughs> contemplating on that question and figuring that out. We're still figuring that out, but I think again, being supportive of each other is something that we appreciate. Yeah. Other questions? That was a long answer. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> like, as you can see, we like to talk. So, <laughs> ask questions. <laughs> yeah. Uh, tell, me, tell me about your creative process. How do you do what you do? Ooh, lots of anger. Um, <laughs> when we work as a group, That's it's kind of tricky. It's, 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 it's a little so messy. And usually the people that perform the poem are the people that wrote the poem. And so, how it yeah. works, like, in terms of, like, the writing process, because I don't, I think we expected, like, since we had, like, basic education that we'd come in with, like, like pretty, like, easy, like, writing styles that could, like, go with each other, but, like, it didn't really work out that way. So, like, writing, like, group pieces is really difficult um, with all four of us. We tried it. It just doesn't work. And we get, and it's very distracting. We get very, like, passive-aggressive, too. Yeah, like, on, like, Google Docs or whatever. Oh, I just just yeah. I don't know what happened to it. I don't know. I don't know. You know? <laughs> Um, yeah, so it'd be like that, but, <laughs> but yeah, so we've, we've kind of like learned to like break it up um, with like two people start off with the poem that like usually like work well together and then the others like build off of whatever draft they have. Yeah. Um, and I think there's a lot of discussion that goes into it, so I think it begins, like, as we said earlier, like, with a discussion and conversation and then as we go on, like, we'll, 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 like, we'll write, like, we'll, we'll, I think we usually write writing group poem. We'll write like the whole thing all together, and then the other time they like, word word vomit, and then we go back and we're like we're like oh Wait, that so word, doesn't make word vomit yeah the word vomit <laughs> like it'll just be like everywhere you know, and then we'll go back and we'll like edit it and we'll be like that doesn't make sense and that contradicts each other, and I also think we could expand a little bit more on that based on this and that and that and that. So I think it's just like kind of scaffolding on each other. And I think what helps like. I like I personally just like recognize this like recently, but what our coaches taught us is like write like with pen and like paper um, first, and then that way you can't like erase anything um, and like critique your writing as you do it because we do that like on Google Docs and stuff like that. So um, I think when we come together and like have those conversations, like writing on paper would be like the best way to start. And then a lot of drafts go into it too. Like sometimes we'll have a poem and then like not go back to it for like a couple of months or like a really long time, and then go back to re edit it and like. Like, that's when it's really good. Yeah, and I think we noticed how different our writing styles are. Like I know for me, and like how uh, how we write, because I think like for me, like, I take a while when I write, and it, it takes a while for um, some inspiration to come. So I watch YouTube videos, um, and sometimes I do have like 
a word vomit uh, poem, and and then sometimes it just takes a while. And like I'll be like doing something, and then like I'll think of a line, and then I'll write it down. So just like sharing our different writing styles and processes. <laughs> I need you guys to fix that mic. Like <laughs> <laughs> I really don't want to turn it off. I'm over it. I don't think it's us. I think it's Alan. No, it was me. I like turned it off oh. during the performance. Oh. Hello. <laughs> oh. Can you guys hear us? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. Other questions? I was wondering about um, how your parents have been supporting you. <laughs> 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 we should have had this question before <laughs> <laughs> uh, American Dreams. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> so the short answer is they don't. Um, <laughs> I mean, they do, but they don't. You know? it's, they drive us to performances, and then that's kind of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, OK. So basically, when we first started doing poetry, um, our parents were like, cool. Like, at that point, we've been doing some activism stuff, being involved in community service, and stuff like that. And our parents were like a very typical American, like, immigrant dream kind of thing. Like, you're going to become a doctor, a lawyer, engineer, or all three at once. You know, that's that kind of mentality, you know? Yeah. And, um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so when we started doing poetry, they're like, we don't really understand what these girls are doing. I don't understand what slam poetry is. Sounds dumb, but whatever. Like, they do them. They'll, they'll be back before eight. We're cool. Whatever. You know, like. <laughs> And um, then we went to Brave New Voices, um, and they figured, like, we told them, like, we're going to go to D.C., then after this competition, like, poetry, that'll be a thing of the past. But the thing is, before Brave New Voices, we met, like, so many times. So, like, yeah, within that like week, that. we would have, like, four performances. And, and two like, workshops. And two workshops yeah. of, like, editing and stuff. So they were, like, really, really tired, because they always <laughs> kept on bringing us to, like, workshops and things. <laughs> so they were sick of it. And our lazy asses didn't have licenses. Like, <laughs> yeah. you know? And then finally, when we get back, they're like, what's going on? Because we decided that we were going to, like, break away from Young Writers Project and be our own entity. And so that, beca that became, like, a whole like I don't know it just took a lot of energy out of us and like took a lot of time um, because you know we'd have to like book our own like appointments and like do website stuff, website stuff all yeah all that stuff so basically they were like what's this is not what we agreed <laughs> on um, and then so ever since then it's kind of been like this weird relationship with but them I think poetry like, and us yeah. in poetry but I think like as they started to understand a little bit more, like see us like doing it, like I think because like once they saw us perform, but also like saw like when their colleagues saw us perform and like when in the classroom and like our younger siblings saw us perform and things like that, I think they started to like, reshape what they thought of it a bit. Because like, originally they're like, we have no idea what this is. Poetry sounds like you're gonna be broke. I don't like it. Um, <laughs> but like once they started like once we started being in the newspaper, getting awards, like getting recognition, especially from our like Muslim community and like within the mosque, like I think people started being like, oh. This is something, and it's doing something. Like I, I'm seeing results, and I'm hearing about it. So maybe it is a worthless, worthless piece of time. You know, like that. So they still bragged about us at the dinners, but you know, <laughs> at home though. Right. Mm -hmm. That's the question. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. Uh, uh, you guys just made me think about this. I don't know if everybody knows. How has your response been from the Muslim <laughs> community as far as I met people that was like poetry is wrong? So have you? met that or have you got what's your response from the it's Muslim been women in the Muslim? overwhelmingly positive I would very say. positive I'd say um, I think one thing that I can that I always remember is that um, our former imam um, would always talk to the youth about us and sort of like um, try to inspire them to do what we're doing um, become activists in the community and uh, really amplify their voices and make change because I think that just shows that Muslims can be seen um, through a positive lens and should be seen in a positive lens. Um, and us being able to condemn these mis misconceptions, a lot of these mus um, the Muslims in our community really support the ability that, and the platform that we have to do that. Yeah, I think like sometimes like a lot like the majority of the support that we were receiving and like the celebration that we were getting from like our poetry was like amazing. But I know like sometimes like culturally it can also be like. Like, a, like, not culturally and religiously, like, a problem just because it's a matter of, like, safety in the day and age that we live in. So, yeah. I know, like, for my parents, like, a lot of, yeah. like, going out late at night and, like, performing and doing all this stuff was, like... Especially on the local topics after, like, the, the yeah. election. Like, I think yeah. it happened even before the election, but, like, after the election especially. And voicing yeah. ourselves out as, like, female Muslim poets, like, mm -hmm. that's... that's. Really I cool. think they are, like, for our parents, they're really concerned for our safety aspect of yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. Which is yeah. understandable. Because we're going to like you know like obscure parts of Vermont in the middle of the night. There's no cell service, you know things like that. Yeah. Um, I think those kind of things like justifiably concern them. Yeah. So I think it was less of like 
they'll be like because of like what you're doing and like religiously un un like uh, unacceptable more like because of your because of what, who you are and like, the identities yeah. you hold and how you'll be perceived. I don't know if I'm comfortable with you being there in yeah. that space. Yeah. So we're not there. Yeah. I want to go do a sport, but it's not safe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do it anyway. It's like, yeah, like yeah. two days for Bowie. We would just meet the driver that's driving us, and they would just like be like, okay, just be back yeah. in time. <laughs> yeah, they definitely see it as something that's like a double edged sword. So it's really interesting to have those conversations with them. What about the future? The future of, yeah. of, of, of us? Or? Yeah, the future of us, are you going to keep writing and performing together? I mean, we're not going to be able to do it as frequently as we were when we were all in college, or at high school together, but we continue to like. Uh, collaborate when we can, um, and we perform individually. Perform as well. individually as well. Um, but we've also been working with a nonprofit that we were once partnered with Denver Arts Project um, through the grant we got to um, continue doing educational stuff within in Vermont, um, both when we were there, but also when we were like away. So you're you're now in college. Yes. And how has this experience allowed you to have your voice in your classroom, in leadership on the campus, mm -hmm. that you know may not even be related to the uh, Muslim aspect of it, or it may. I'm just curious how, how that's changed you. Mm -hmm. You want to start? I mean, like, as we've mentioned before, I think I've definitely gained individually, gained a lot of confidence um, and the ability to speak in class. I remember in high school, uh, before MGMC had even started, so like freshman year and then also middle school, I was always so anxious to raise my hand in class, even though I like knew the answer. I always thought like, oh, I can't formulate the sentence well, or like I just, I don't know, like I just feel like my answer isn't good enough. So I think like being able to talk with these girls about specific issues, current affairs, um, and really gaining knowledge with them has gained my confidence to be able to speak in class. Um, and then speaking in front of like a group of people a lot has definitely made me used to like uh, public speaking. Um, and I think like we've learned a lot of like skills, like like networking, we just learned, gained a lot of like knowledge just from like the different like conferences and opportunities that we've had. And so that's, I think that makes it easier in like a college setting because a lot of the topics that are covered have to do with like things that we have a pretty good grasp on. Mm -hmm. And so it, participating is not like as difficult um, and sharing our experiences, they become rich. In, and uh, I also in a I college think, classroom. sorry, go ahead. Um, I also think that because like, like before MGMC, I think all four of us were really reluctant to talk about our experiences, like our identities, especially. Like, and like I don't think we, had, like in the classroom, I don't think we were like, it was like we we're all just trying to talk about our identity, but we we're all just like, like even if in a, like in a moment, if anything touched our identity, like anything related to race came up, we'd all be like, mm, we're gonna leave you now, you know? And I think that we really like inhibited ourselves from participating fully because we were just scared of all the speaking, being seen as like that angry like Muslim girl, that angry brown girl, that angry black girl, whatever else. Um, but I think by being able to like go on stage and speak and just like, just really say our truth because we're not quoting stats or anything right now. We're really just speaking from our experiences. Mm -hmm. So the the confidence of like and the ability to to do that I think really helps me in the classroom because I'm able to be like, well, I know my experience and I know that is true. Like they can't take that away from me. Like whatever they say, this is my experience. And I think that confidence and like knowing that like I belong in that space and I have like what I think and have experienced has value and will add input to that conversation um, has been really beneficial for me. And that's, as they said earlier. Gives me the confidence to speak in class and to know that, like, and to call out. Yeah, and to call out also when I feel like something I'm hearing doesn't match my experience. You know, I'm like, that doesn't seem like what I think a Muslim is. That doesn't seem like what I think. What you know, it knows it just like doesn't seem right. So I think through that poetry, we've been like able to gain those skills as well. And like the experiences we've had, whether that was attending workshops or going to conferences, I felt like that really helped me for college and choosing the path that I want to go, and like choosing my major and the classes that I want to take and the conversations I want to be a part of. So that really like helped me um, really narrow my focus. Engineering. Engineering, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, medicine, all four of us. <laughs> so, kind of like piggybacking off of his question. Um, so, like, I know I said, I got a lot of empowering and positive reactions. What negative reactions have you had? Like, what hate have you had? Like, whether it's culturally or like just like prejudice from people who aren't Muslim or anything like that. Like, what negative feedback have you had from this? <laughs> Jordy is positive actually, which is really really nice, but there have been times. <laughs> like I think a lot of times what can be frustrating yeah. with performing poetry is that sometimes how people in the audience will come to hear you speak and will think they're done. And they'll be like, I heard you I listened to your experience. I'm not gonna do anything with that, I will not change anything in my life. 
and I'm gonna keep going, and I'm gonna re reaffirm, like I reaffirm my wokeness or whatever because I listen to like four like people of color or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that can be really frustrating because I think people come in then with their own like preconceived mindsets and they're just, like, they're just trying to reaffirm whatever they already know. So sometimes they'll come up to us afterwards and they'll say like pretty prejudiced things to us, but they're like, you know, it's so great. You told me so much about your hijab and your oppressive religion. I'm like, whoa, whoa, you know, and things like that. So I think like sometimes like that can be really frustrating for us because it's like. Did you not just listen to the poetry? Like we were emotional. We like you know that that takes energy and emotional like um, like emotional banks or whatever to like do that. And like if we put ourselves out there and and we're received by someone who's like not really listening to us, that can be really hard. Um, yeah. And then all, and a part like something that comes from that is like we live since we live in a predominantly like white like state. Um, a lot of the performances, even though we, I think. Sometimes we would like advertise it or gear it towards like very like diverse voices, but then we get a lot of like white like attendance, which is which is not like anything like to criticize, but it's just um, it's interesting to observe because um, you know some of these conversations are missing like a lot of these diverse voices. So when we perform, like we also want like the collaboration between the two different. Yeah. Um, Binary groups, and there's times where we've been like performing, and like this one time, this lady was like, "Oh, I'm a oh, Christian," yeah. you know. She goes, oh, 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 "She goes, how do I not be racist anymore?" I'm just like, "We're <laughs> 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 like, like this situation," and she was the first one to ask a question. We're like, "It was a cute day." She goes, "How do I like not be racist anymore?" I'm like, "Oh." <laughs> I feel like it's also gets so tiring. Like activism is so awesome and stuff, but also like it's not our job to educate everybody, you know. And so like, oh. <laughs> like at times I'm just yeah. like, okay, yes, but like, or not. people ask us to speak on experiences that we don't have. Yeah. Like number of people who ask us about Saudi women, I'm like, I'm not a Saudi woman. Like, I don't live there. Like where am I right now? You know? There was like, I can't tell you. <laughs> you get like. There was a performance where a guy is like, okay, like I understand you guys have like all this freedom to do what you want to do, but like how do you feel about women in like the Middle East? And I'm like, I can't speak on those experiences because I don't relate to it. I've never been through it, you know? So there's a bit of a couple, check yeah. Yeah. Like that too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then there's also been like a lot of like weird questions, like just like people just like ignorant of like just Islam or like Muslims in general. So like one guy like- Are you allowed to wear jewelry? Like, are you, are you, <laughs> do you speak Muslim? Do you speak Muslim? 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 That was a scary part of Vermont. Like, <laughs> I don't know what it was called. Get out by. Get out by. Bro, it was called Montgomery, Vermont. There was a Confederate flag like, like down right the street. as we were driving. Yeah. There was one person pulling the audience and she left and we're like, you can't do that? You can't do that? Like, bro, let bro. I would have too. I would have dipped. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, in New York, like, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I I wondered how many people have actually seen just a raise of hands in the room. How many people have got the shivers or the chills? Any part of I think like three coats. I just thank you that um, breaking my heart open and uh, it's so so touching and uh, so it's, I guess it's okay. People cry a lot. Um, and. Yeah, so lots of questions. One, I just want to uh, let you know I'd love to connect you with another group that does beautiful work. And, and yeah, let's definitely, yeah. And uh, how do you call out uh, the prejudice when yeah. you see it? In the moment, as you see it? Yeah. Um, I think for me, like, prejudice comes in a lot of, like, different ways, or just, like, ignorance comes in a lot of different ways. And I think I need, to, like, over time, I've learned to, like, understand what I need to be calling out and what I need to be calling in. Mm -hmm. So, cause a lot of people are not coming from any like harmful place. They're just mm -hmm. not aware. So sometimes like it's not, it's not about like calling it out. Um, and it's really seeking the opportunity to educate them. Um, but if, you know, I'm not having a good day, then I'm not, I ain't gonna do that. But, <laughs> <laughs> but like, um, it's, and then I'll call it out when it's really obviously like, like against me or like, something that I'm like representing um, mm -hmm. and I clearly see that and I need to be yeah. doing that as yeah. my responsibility. And, and, yeah. and going off of that, I think definitely being more comfortable with being uncomfortable is something that I'm still trying to get used to as well um, and really calling out things that not only affects me but also affects a bunch of Muslims or a, a bunch of Arabs or different identity markers that I hold. Um, but then again, it does get tiring and sometimes it's it's too much for me to call out and that I don't have to be the teacher all yeah. the time. I think for me when I like whenever I get in a situation I'm like I'm like, whoa, I don't whoa, whoa. 
I think what I like to do is kind of like ask the dog, like, what do you mean by that? Or what is that? You know, like, mm-hmm. explain, please. And then they have to explain their reasoning. And, then they're, and, then, they're, and then they're like, wait, they're you know? <laughs> and then the, the pressure's on you because you're not the one explaining it to them. They're the ones like realizing themselves. Yeah. Um, and then other times, like, I'll, like, or sometimes, like, situations that I'm often in are like people like, like, like the Saudi Arabia thing, like people ask me questions to, or like, ask me like, can you explain this verse or can you explain blah, 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 can you explain blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, well, no, I, and I'll be very adamant. I'll be like, no, I can't because I'm only one person and I'm 18 years old and my <laughs> understanding of Islam, I'm not a scholar. Like I'm an 18 year old girl, you're an 18 year old Jew. Like we can't, I can't tell you everything about your religion. You know, like that kind of thing, you know? So sometimes I'll, like, I'll be really adamant, like I'm not going to. No, I can't. I'm sorry. I have my interpretation. I can't tell you the world, you know? So just being really firm sometimes as well. We're going to have three more questions. Ooh. I have one. Yeah. Oh, um, I heard you talk about collaborations, and for a lot of us, we are teachers. We'd love to be able to share what you're doing. I was just wondering if you could tell us, like, A, what would be your like, <coughs> ultimate collaboration? Like, if we could next. A, B, or C. Beyonce. And, <laughs> and if you could charge us with, like, how can we help you advance the work that you're doing? Is it just by Twitter or by sharing? Because I think we want to share it in the honest way that you want. Cool. I like that question. <laughs> like, you never gotten that question. I know. <laughs> um, honestly, I think. Well, I think one thing we have talked a lot about is like, I mean, like you can share us on Twitter or like we have a Facebook, Instagram, all that stuff like that, YouTube. Um, but I think honestly, just like one thing that's been really super inspiring for us as we go into classrooms and do work has been um, really just like giving, like us, like, when we give uh, younger students like the space to just talk about whatever without any direction, like often, like just to be like, like we'll often do our poetry and then they'll be like, oh, cool, I'm allowed to talk about my identity or maybe touchy subjects that maybe I haven't talked about in the classroom otherwise or haven't talked with my friends as much. And then we also sometimes, like, especially we'll either do our poem or we'll um, show a poem that's like more humorous and funny and show that poetry can be both like serious, it can be funny, it can be a mix as, as like you saw with Hijab 101 or um, uh, Women's Role or something like that. You can see like the poetry isn't just meant to be one thing, it can be whatever you want it to be. So I think really um, giving young people the space to like explore their emotions and feelings and like I guess what we've done so far, like not critiquing it, like in a way, be like, oh, that wasn't like mad enough, that wasn't activisty enough, that was, but like being like, that's what your truth is, you know? Really, I think that's been really cool. For and us. then giving them the access to the space, so um, like a lot of like adults, like just don't make it like convenient enough for like students <laughs> or like just young people to like participate in things, mm-hmm. and so. I don't know whether that's stipend, transportation, talking to their parents, talking to their parents, like finding a way to like work with them um, that doesn't require a lot from them yeah. is really helpful. I think that's honestly helped us so much in high school because, like, as I said, our lazy asses never got licenses, so you know, <laughs> getting rides is a really big thing, and like, Vermont public transportation is not DC public transportation, so uh, you know, a lot of times we'd have people like people um, we'd be going to performances out of like far, further away places, and someone would offer us a ride, and that would make it possible for us to go to certain places. Or um, talking to our parents, as Keith mentioned earlier, before we left, so they'd know that the place was safe and like where we were going was okay. So like there isn't necessarily something to do for us, but it's just like really supporting your students, supporting the youth in your communities, whether that's giving them a platform, holding that space for them to really let them be themselves and express themselves. And if you see like us as like inspiration for them, like we do, it's feel free to like use our media and our, yeah. and our videos to share with them. And uh, you guys kind of touched on this a little bit, but I'm just kind of curious, because obviously you guys kind of expose things that are like really touchy, like <coughs> you talk about things that are, you know, where you're in a place that you're vulnerable. How does that affect you, like on a personal level, individually, when you guys are doing your research, when you're watching your videos and things like that, when you're putting together your poems, how do you guys cope with that? Obviously, it's very empowering because I was feeling a lot of that. <laughs> you guys, so you I, I recommend it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was just like watching you all the time. Okay. So cool. right. um, and I'm just kind of curious how you guys handle that, obviously. Honestly, if it was an individual, I think I don't think I could do it. You know, if I didn't have that, I wouldn't be able to do it. Because it can be really, like, when you write a poem and it's like emotional, like, as you can see, like, you don't write a poem, like, calmly being like, Sometimes I'm mad about Islamophobia. Islamophobia can be hard. It's like, you know, period. Like, it comes with, it's like, I'm so mad, I can't believe my teacher asked me that question in class, I can't believe that this happened, you know? Um, 
So like I think uh, like 100% the fact that like we can talk about it and rant about it yeah. and that like someone will actually listen like listen to what we're saying without trying to put their opinion in and that kind of thing really means the world. And that's the mm -hmm. thing with poetry, you guys can't you can't this, you know? <laughs> 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 Um, I think also a big thing is like, like I struggled with this like one piece about like being black and like low income just cause like that was a story that I'd never like expressed before. So I think like sometimes what that boy helped me through that piece was like taking a break from it. So like I wrote it, but then I was like, I don't have to like finish this for the stage right now or even perform it for the stage. Cause like sometimes some pieces are just like paper, poems. Paper, yeah. paper poems, right. And not like stage poems. So like, um, taking a break from it checking in with your mental health um, and making sure that you're like really ready for um, the step that you're about to take with that piece. And that's the thing, sometimes when we're performing, like you see us like grounding down, and, like taking the moment to like bring ourselves back to when we first wrote the poem, especially with Wake Up America. Cause I feel like that's one of our hardest poems and um, it really takes us a second before we can just go and like start the poem right away. Mm -hmm. yeah. And definitely be able to write the poem for yourself and not for the audience is something yeah. that we have learned to do more and more. Um, and I think that's what makes our poem obviously more stronger. Um, and then, but it is definitely scary to put yourself in that vulnerable position because you're sharing a piece of yourself to the crowd, to a bunch of strangers. But you have to remember like why you wrote it, why this is important for others to listen and hear. Um, and you're speaking yeah. on behalf of like everybody else that doesn't have this platform, you know? So I think that's what makes it like really, really important. It's like I'm giving this opportunity and this platform. How am I gonna like help others who don't have the voice or who don't have or the opportunity? Or how to bring other people with me up. Yeah. yeah. That's where my question comes in. Now that you're in college and meeting other people and working possibly on poetry with other people, have you given any thought or started to think about sharing how you do what with others and bringing other people into a group so that you actually grow a movement? Well, I mean, first we're also first semesters and freshmen, so we're still getting adjusted. Yeah. Um, but we are working with the year. Yeah, like give us a year. Like, <laughs> well, let's figure out what our major is. Um, <laughs> and dorms aren't it, but um, like, <laughs> uh, but we have been working with um, Vermont youth, particularly. I don't think as much as like in our college communities yet. Uh, this time we are still getting adjusted to that new space and learning and workload and all that stuff like that. But um, we're working with Young Rise Project in specific, uh, particularly to do workshops with um, Vermont, or, yeah, Vermont youth in Vermont and um, that kind of thing. But I know when we like got like super into like like the poetry scene, like we we were so like really excited about that and that was like the ultimate goal. So I know there's like a ton of different organizations from various states that we've been trying to like find a way to like collaborate yeah. with, some amazing poets that we've met over yeah. the time and that have been doing their own individual things but then also like collectively yeah. they're, they're always down to do that. So um, yeah, so maybe sometime in the future like finding a way that we can all come together in like one space would be ideal. Yeah. Yeah. Pray who voices next year. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so Hala, Lena, Kieran, Malkisa, thank you so much. Love you.